This video is going to introduce the concept of encoding a Turing machine. That is, taking the definition of a Turing machine as a tuple and turning it into a string, which may be a member of some language. One of the benefits that comes from this is once we can do this, and then we can do the same for the pushdown automata and the finite state machines, we can start answering questions about sets of machines in the same way that we've already been able to answer questions about sets of strings. And that is immensely powerful. So all I need you to remember for this one is what the tuple definition of a Turing machine is. So set of states, alphabet, tape alphabet, transition function, start state, and set of halting states. Because we are going to find, we are going to describe a way to turn each of these into part of a string from a specific alphabet. And this alphabet is not going to change no matter what Turing machine we want to encode. So we will have a way to make a language of all of the Turing machines. One of the benefits of having the Turing machine is we now have a model that describes a lot more computation than we could talk about before. So we can accept a lot of string, we can, sorry, we can accept a lot of languages that we couldn't before and we can compute functions in ways that we couldn't quite before. So what is the benefit of taking a machine and turning it into a string? Why would, why would we want to do that? And the reason is, is let's say we had the machines and we wanted to decide is this representing a program that will eventually halt? Or rather, will this program always halt? That would be a really useful thing to be able to say. If we could grab any computer program, feed it into a machine, and have that machine say, yes, this program will always halt, or no, here is a list of strings this machine will loop forever on. That would be handy. Being able to turn Turing machines or programs into strings gives us the ability to answer these questions and particularly gives us the ability to tell whether or not we can answer these questions. So the first thing we need to decide is what we actually need to encode. Obviously, we need to encode the states. We need to say this machine has these states. Clearly, we need to encode the input alphabet because we could have any particular inf input alphabet, but if we want our strings to come from a set alphabet, then we need to turn the arbitrary elements of these alphabets into elements of our own. But if we encode the tape alphabet, remember that sigma is a subset of the tape alphabet. So if we encode this, then we will have encoded this. Clearly we need to include the um, transition function because it defines the operation of the machine. Not having that means we don't know what the machine does. If we have encoded all of the states, then we have encoded the start state, and we also know that H is a subset of K. So if we have encoded K, then we have encoded H. So in reality, all we need to encode is K, Gamma, and Delta. And everything else will already be encoded. One of the things that we will do is we will encode something special about S so that we always know which one is the start state. So the way we encode all of the elements of the states is by turning them into numbers. Now one of the things is that for any machine, the number of states that we have, k, will be finite. That means that we can enumerate them, we can give them all a number. So what we do is we pick the state which is the start state, so let's say this is the start state, and we give it the value 0, and then we just give all of the other states our value doesn't really matter. So this one will be zero. In this case, I'm just going to go one, two, three. But we could order them however we want. Just the start state has to be zero. Then we are going to pick an arbitrary symbol. And for the rest of the course, the symbol we're going to use in this state is Q. And what we do is we put a fixed length binary string after that that represents the state number. So this particular set of states has four states in it. The shortest binary string that I can use to represent all of those numbers has two bits because I can represent 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 and they're all unique. For more states I need more but we 
pick our fixed length binary state to be uh, uh, string to be as short as possible whilst being able to give a unique value to all of the states. So what we do is we take each state, we have Q as a pre um, a uh, prefix, and then we give it its number. So the start state always gets zero, and then the other states get one number, one after the other. Now in the case that our states are accepting and rejecting states, and you'll learn a little bit more about this, we have states that say yes and no. If we have those ones, our machine has to be able to know that they are yes or no states. So whenever we have the state Y or the state N, we just give it Y or N as the first part of its encoding instead of Q. So this state becomes Y10 and this state becomes N11. You'll learn more about Y and N in the future but just keep this in mind for later. The tape alphabet is just as simple but the benefit is, is we don't have to worry about accepting or rejecting symbols and we don't have to worry about start symbols. In fact no symbols are special except for the blank but even then it's really not that special. So what we do is we just arbitrarily enumerate them and give them all a binary string just like before and we make sure that the binary string is as short as possible whilst being able to give a unique value to each of them. And then we prepend with a different symbol instead of Q. So all of the states started with Q. All of our alphabet are going to start encodings, are going to start with an A. So when I have five elements, I need at least three bits to represent all of the elements uniquely. So I'm going to tag them like this. It doesn't really matter exactly what encoding you give them, just as long as each one gets a unique binary um, representation. So my states are going to become A000, A001, A010, A011, and in this case the blank is going to be labeled A100. You can pick whatever you want. So we can see here that we've, been, we've given a finite string to each of the elements from our alphabet. And that's because our alphabet is finite and the length of a number, a length of a binary string that you need to represent to enumerate a finite set of elements is finite. So overall, our string that represents all of the tape alphabet elements is finite in length, even though it's longer than the original alphabet. Encoding delta is actually very simple. When you realize that all delta is, is a tuple that has a state, a symbol, a state, a symbol, and then a direction to move, it becomes very easy to encode it because all we do is we actually write down the brackets and the commas, that's part of the encoding, and then we insert the encoded state, symbol, state, symbol elements. So if the state was Q0, remember from our encoding before, we encode that as Q00. If the symbol was a B, that was encoded as A01, so that encoding goes in there. If the next state it's going to is the yes state, in that case, I believe from memory it was Y10, but we write the encoding in anyway. And then we write the encoding of the symbol that we leave on the tape head, so in that case we might have gone and written a blank, which was, oh sorry, this was A001. In this case, this would be A100. And then we literally write a left or a right or a down arrow depending for whatever the move was. So if it was move left, the symbol that's written down is a left arrow. That is a string from a finite alphabet that no matter what our machine is, can represent one of the elements of the um, transition relation. So as I said before, we don't need to worry about encoding sigma because it is already encoded when we, all of the elements of it are already encoded when we encode the tape alphabet. We don't need to worry about encoding H because all of its elements are already been encoded by K and the defining attribute of an element of, K, of H sorry, is that it is never on the left hand side of the transition function. So it's a set of states that halt and we don't have transitions out of them. So we don't have to worry about encoding element, uh, giving them a special encoding because they are already encoded as halting states by just not being part of delta. Now remember that we've already encoded S but we still need to know which one S is 
And the way we do that is we just always give the start state the encoding of the value zero. So if we have four binary digits that we need, then the start state will be whichever state gets this encoding. So what you should now know is roughly a way in which we can turn a Turing machine into a string. And particularly what we're concerned about is turning a Turing machine into a string that comes from a specific alphabet. So in this case, our alphabet contains Q, A, Y, N, 0, 1, open and close brackets, left and right arrows, maybe a down arrow, and the comma symbol. What we've shown is that we can turn any definition of a Turing machine into something from this alphabet clean, this one fixed alphabet. We can always produce a string from this alphabet, and, it, and if a Turing machine exists, it can be represented as a string from this alphabet. And that's really, really useful because now we can start reasoning about sets of Turing machines in the same way that we've already reasoned about sets of strings.